Roger Ryan is a multi-Grammy, Dove-nominated, and Juno award-winning producer with a ton of top-tier experience. His work as singer, songwriter, performer, arranger, producer, and director has spanned a wide range of genres. Directing multiple choirs and small groups, his talents have taken him around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Tahiti, the Fiji Islands, Vienna, Germany, Milan, Ukraine, Hungary, and the UK, Moscow, just to name a few. Highlights in Roger's career include these. First, music director for gospel diva, C.C. Winans. Musician with country artist Winona Judd. Arranger and producer for the Reverend Shirley Caesar, who is known as the Queen of Gospel. Writer and arranger for various recording artists such as Yolanda Adams, Alvin Slaughter, and many others. He was invited by Ashley Judd, yes, the actress, to play for her wedding in Scotland. He toured Europe as a vocalist with the acclaimed group Take Six, and we'll be talking about that for sure. He did live performances with artists such as, just to name a few, Whitney Houston, Layla Hathaway, Faith Hill, Michael W. Smith, Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Earl Klug, Kirk Whalem, Denise Williams, Amy Grant, Kenny Rogers, Fred Hammond, Jackie Velasquez, Crystal Gale, Karen Clark Sheard, Anointed, Desmond Pringle, and the Blue Notes. If you go to Roger's About page at rogerryan.net, and that's R-Y-A-N, you will find a long list of some of his work through the years, from performing at the White House to arranging and directing Duke Ellington's Martin Luther King celebration featuring Della Reese. Ah. In addition to all this, Roger has lent his considerable skills to local church ministries, such as Grace Point Church in Nashville. Additionally, he's a skilled musician and has conducted music and producer workshops in several cities. In the early 90s, he founded his production company, After Touch Music, which is where I met him as he and I were working with the same new artist. Roger is currently involved in numerous recording projects, of course. Now, let's talk to the man himself. Welcome, Roger Ryan. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. It's good to be here. It's an honor to chat with you. <laughs> okay, being that this is all things vocal podcast, I want to start out by talking about the most awarded a cappella group in history of which you were a member. Take six. Quincy Jones called them the baddest vocal cats on the planet, okay, which is quite an accolade from, from Quincy Jones. What was it like? Well, uh, take six is a really big, big deal in my life. Um, Mm -hmm. When I went to college, my, I went to a thing called College Days. I went my 11th year in high school to Huntsville, Alabama, thinking that I was going to be a doctor. And so they showed us <laughs> the campus and showed us the, the new science building. And, you know, we have such a high rate of acceptance into Harvard Medical School, blah, blah, blah. Then they took us to this hall called Moran Hall, and this choir got up and sang a hundred kids. I had never heard music like that before and I thought I was going to die. Well, the person playing the <laughs> piano was Mervyn Warren and the person directing the choir was Mark Kibble. Um, <laughs> and I was, I was floored. I had never seen anything like that or heard anything like that in person before. So I went up and I talked to Mark and I said, Hey, I want to come to school here. I'm going to come here, you know, when I, you know, when I graduate and he said, okay, we'll see, you know, it was very fun, very fine, very, uh, very, kind to me. And I, I came back for the school homecoming. I came back with my 12th year and then I eventually went to school there. And uh, I joined their choir and he said, you need to stop sitting in the back singing tenor. You need to play. So I started playing for the group from time to time. And then I found out that they had an acapella group. They took me into their room where they rehearse on Friday nights. And uh, man, when I heard this music, I walked out of there and I was like, okay, black aliens exist. <laughs> I've never heard or seen <laughs> before in my life. And uh, at the time I was a pre-med pre major and it was right around the time that I told my dad into my sophomore year, I'm not going to med school. 
and he was not happy with that. And Mark and the guys were thinking about really going fully professional. And so they invited me to join the group at the time they were looking for a baritone. And I told them, I told them actually Claude McKnight, I said, you're going to have to ask my dad. And my dad said, no, Roger's coming home this summer. So I stopped learning the, the parts with them, went home, most miserable summer of my life. And they signed their deal over that summer and became take six. So I got to travel with them, but I didn't get to be in the group originally, which I still have a thing about that somewhere. <laughs> but to get a chance to tour with them for a month, we did a European tour. And it was mm -hmm. a tour of a lifetime for me. I mean, I, I could tell I wasn't up to snuff with the guys because they've been doing it together for so long, you know. But boy, it was amazing from Milan, Italy, all the way to Moscow. And it was fun. I mean, wow. it was fun to travel with them because we have history all in school together. They're the reason you actually know me. Mark is the reason you know me. Really? If I had not gone to that school or joined that group or met Mark, I don't know if you would have known me. I give Mark a lot of credit for my music career. In fact, he looked after me when I moved to Nashville, you know. I mean, I believe God had a hand in my career for sure. But he sent Mark. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah. yeah, Mark yes, was yeah. the person who gave me a push even when I moved here. I'm talking about how I lived, where I stayed, all of that stuff. Mark is the person mm -hmm. who did that. And his brother, Joey. I'm indebted to them forever. It's probably why I'm always looking to help and to share and to give whenever I get an opportunity because of the way my career started. One thing I know about you is you definitely pass it down. Let's back up a little bit. Were you born in Trinidad? Am yes, I right about that? I was that? born in the country of Trinidad and Tobago. Two islands, one country. So I started playing the piano when I was four. My parents said they heard. I started when I was six. You started when you were four. Yeah. yeah. My parents said they heard all this music coming out of the living room. This is when we lived in, in, in New York. We lived in Long Island. And uh, they came downstairs and they saw me playing and I couldn't reach the pedals. So <laughs> my parents moved, you know, we moved to, yeah, yeah, we moved to the States when I was about 18 months old and, um, stayed there until I was about seven. My dad got called back to do, to build a high school. My dad's an educator and a counselor. So we went back to Tobago ah. and built a Christian high school there, which is still standing there. It's actually pretty amazing. When we, he built it, the wow. first prime minister and presidents of our country's history at the time came to the dedication of this little school in Tobago, you know, it was, it was a big deal. It was national news, you know, and yeah. uh, so I was watching my dad do his dream. And meanwhile, I was dreaming, but yeah, maybe it wasn't, you know, and, and the culture in, in the Caribbean is based on the British culture. So, you know, yeah, music is a wonderful hobby and, you know, that kind of thing. But in my head, I told my dad when I was about nine, I dreamed of playing in front of thousands of people. I mean, I saw it clearly in my head, <laughs> but you know, you don't talk back to your dad when you're nine. And the interesting thing is, Judy, I was a, a, a freshman in high school. I was nine when I went to high school. My birthday's in September, so I turned 10 in high school. Wow. So here I am, I'm oh nine. Oh my goodness. I'm playing for church already and now just starting piano lessons, but I'm playing at church, you know. Yeah. Um, and this was in Tobago. My first piano teacher was Mrs. Armstrong. I'll never forget her. She was sweet. And my dad actually mm -hmm. went to her and she said, I don't take kids this young. So he left me and left me at, left me at her place <laughs> and drove off. And I, I went in and I started playing and she said, okay, I'll take you. That's, that's the <laughs> true story. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. That um, is so funny. Yeah. Most of my life has been, you know, music and science. I was always intrigued with science. Music and science. Yeah, I had chemistry sets. Wow. Sets. Um, I really thought yeah. I was going to be a doctor, and I was really passionate about becoming a doctor. I wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon. I was wow. shadowing a couple of doctors in Houston that fixed holes in babies' hearts. Of course, there was no, no internet back then, so I was doing that, you know, through the library. I think Mike DeBakey is responsible for the artificial heart, and some other things, but you know, I just thought oh, these guys hung the moon and I wanted to be like them. But all the while I was doing that music, 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 I'm playing here and playing there, you know, and, um, it, it just came to a head when I got to college, you know, I run into Mark and these guys and there's all this music on this campus. 
And I, I said, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't go to med school. That's really funny because I had a bit of a similar situation. I was living in Miami when I was in junior high and high school, and we had advanced classes. And I was on uh, you know, on schedule to become a research scientist, and that's what I wanted to be. Wow. And music was always, I mean, I'd done music since I was two, you know, uh, both piano. And, and I also started out just playing by ear, taught by my grandfather. But my, my father then moved to Jacksonville, and the schools were not good. Mm -hmm. So I just didn't crack a book and ended up, you know, not definitely not continuing with a science career, but, uh, but the, the avenues for music were in Jacksonville and I, I did my first national jingle there. So it's funny how we're sort of corralled mm -hmm. into certain areas, you know, but with, with music being an insecure field, which it is all of the fields of the arts, uh, commercially are going to be insecure, you know, but, uh, I think you go into them because you can't not. <laughs> no, you can't <laughs> not. I agree. Pulled. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't even know how many times I have just, even now I'm talking to you and I hear music. You know, it's just, uh, yeah. It's, yeah. I, I don't know why I didn't think that's what I, all I want to do and who was I fooling starting a med program? You know what I mean? I think I was doing mm -hmm. that at that point. I started doing it for my parents and not so much for me. You know, um, mm -hmm. and that's taken some time to rectify. In fact, you know, I'm doing therapy just to connect some dots because, you know, I yeah. have some gaps Excellent. in my life and my childhood and those gaps yeah. have to do with the choice and choices, you know. But, you know, like you said, it's, uh, yeah, I didn't do some of the things on my terms. I missed probably 10 Grammys. <laughs> yeah. But, but. <laughs> <laughs> like you said, you know, the turning point, it, it became a turning point. And so I really had to go work for it. And not that it was given to me by the guys, but I would have gone for the ride, so to speak, and become a better vocalist, Sure, probably become a different, better musician in a different way. Who knows? But this, this journey definitely it was a turning point and I had to fuel it myself. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. it's all good. Everything I've had to let go of every brick wall, every quote unquote failure, everything that I, you know, didn't get to do. I've left scratch marks like the cat poster, you know, with the, with the, <laughs> like, hold on, I'm trying to hold on to it. And there's scratch marks all the way down. But I am now I'm really grateful for having to let go. And I realized that those things, those places that we've been, Roger, they, they become a part of what we can do now. And even to the point where people can trust us because we have been there. We know what it feels like. We know what it takes. Yes. And, uh, and if, if we hadn't had those experiences, but it's hard to be in the limelight and, and be, you know, publicly successful and all that kind of stuff and be, uh, the front person, you know, and then have that ripped from you and you feel like you're nothing, you know, or you could have been, you could have been, I'm only now really coming to grips with that and thinking to myself, it's not about that. It's about what value can I put in the world? And that's what I see you do. Absolutely. I try. Um, <laughs> you know, in the field of the arts, I've said forever that one needs to learn to be on roller skates and to have multiple <laughs> streams of income, right? Yeah. And you have such an incredibly extensive list of top level credits in every creative music industry, you know, kind of area. What, Roger, we've just, just talked about a little of it, but what has been your mindset and your process for knowing what window to go through next? <laughs> um, so that's a funny, loaded question. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> being a young church boy and being, you know, growing up in church, I want to say that God opened doors for me. I, I, I believe that. And I really can't make up some of the stuff that I did when the windows that I walked through. Like when I became... CC's music director, I didn't know, and she probably didn't know at the time that we'd be doing a White House show and I'd be co-producing it with PBS, you know, while Bill Clinton was in office. Like, mm -hmm. I, yeah. you know, um, did I think I'd get to meet Whitney through her? Maybe. But, you know, to meet her and to play for her, two different things, you know, and even where I met her, I shouldn't have been there. I was at the Songwriters Hall of Fame induction ceremonies and it was a tribute to Diana Ross. 
So that day at the office, <laughs> I meet Paul Simon, I meet Susan DePass, I meet Barry Gordy, I meet Luther Vandross, I meet Leslie Uggams, oh my gosh. John Starks, who was a famous basketball player who played with the Knicks for a long time, one of my favorite players, actually. And this chick named Whitney Houston, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, <laughs> it was just the craziest thing. And I took one photograph with her, which I, I keep near and dear to my heart. I said, hey, you're taking pictures with everybody with, with sing my background singers, but you're not taking pictures with the music director. And she said, <laughs> look right here. And we took this picture and it's the craziest thing, you know, but um, I, I, I did not know that that window opened all these other windows. And I was actually sitting in my house when I got called to even work for Cece, uh, her brother-in-law called me and I was all set to do a record, a live recording in, in um, Toronto, Canada, a group called Toronto Mass. And I signed this deal and he said, well, Cece's looking for a music director. She needs you to come play for her. That was the conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> there. And you thought, you thought to yourself, okay, let me think about it. Right. right. I, you know, so yeah. I went over to this place where they had already started rehearsing. And, um, you know, I walked in there and a group called the Katinas were in there. I had met them over the years as a, a little musician myself. I played for a group called the Heritage Singers. I met them in, in the West Coast, and here they are in Nashville about to be her band. Like, all the things that lined up were just kind of weird, you know? Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. It opened other doors. To this day, I, I get called for things because of because of CC, because of Whitney, because of those major things that I did, The you know, the talk shows, Good Morning America, Gordon Elliott, Rosie O'Donnell, mm -hmm. CBS This Morning, NBC This Morning. Like, I can't make up any of that stuff. And I still get called because of those things and, and share it in my workshops and clinics. So one of the other windows would be, um, I mean, there's some other big groups that I, you know, I did a, a tour called the A Tour. I was a music director for that, which was the largest grossing tour since the Young Messiah Tour. It was Avalon, Anointed, Nicole Norderman. So now the Doves happen and I'm playing, oh my goodness. you know, the Dove Awards and I'm playing for two artists on the Doves. You know, I've got my own riser with my stuff and they're moving mine out and bring it back. Boy, did I feel important for about two hours, you know, pretty cool. <laughs> but that entire week I was busy all week, Judy, playing at every hotel, you know, the Renaissance down at the Wild Horse Saloon. In fact, one year, the year that I did that, I met Mary Mary. They were little girls with their postcards and they walked in and said, Hey, you know, we love your music. We're Mary Mary. And we have a, we have a single coming out. I was like, oh, okay. All right, little girls. Nice. You know, next thing you know, NBA, <laughs> in NBA inside stuff and boom shackles. And here's Mary Mary and boom, they blow up, you know, like I was yeah. around so many interesting yeah. people at the time that were blowing up. So those windows, they were just opened and I just, they opened for you. Yeah. You know, I just kind of walked yeah, through them just and, I walked through them graciously yeah. and carefully. I never, I never took myself too seriously and was like, well, look at me, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. In fact, not many people actually realized I was playing for CC until they actually came to a concert. And like, I didn't know you were playing for and my college friends who got went to it. I'd always make sure they had comp tickets or my cousins or my relatives and the television shows. I only told my mother. Cause you know, I just never, my parents raised me to be humble. And so I'd call my mom and you know, she would, with her Trini accent say, <laughs> boy, just praise God and thank Jesus. You get into do these big things, you know, but I never told anybody else. So she would watch me on good morning America and people call me, you're on good morning, Mike. Why do you tell us? Well, I figure if you watch good morning America, you would see me. I don't need to tell you, <laughs> you know, I called her from the, the, the secret service car on the way to the South grounds of the white house, you know, this <laughs> dude is driving me over there. Just me. Right. And my mom yeah. said, mom, I'm in the most secure car in the country. I'm in, I'm in the, you know, and she's just praising God on the phone. So, you know, I don't know how to show off because she's telling me, you know, if you serve God, you're going <laughs> to, he's going to take you in front of kings and queens, boy. I'm like, yes, mom. And you know what? <laughs> he did. So, <laughs> he did. So I just kind That's of, amazing. you know, I just chuckle and, and smile. And um, when I show up, I show up with a smile. I always break the ice with some humor and, and still um, intense and do the music I'm, I'm getting to do and love to do, but never took myself so seriously. I'm, I'm this, I'm that, you know, just, I just do it and have fun. Yeah. I think it, it's so important to uh, be willing to change what we're doing. If, if a new window opens up, that looks like we should go through it, but we have to be ready. We have to show up for work. We have to actually move through that window and show up for work. And we also have to be ready to work. We, you know, you have to 
know how to do what you do. And that sure. has taken a ton of work. I know you study, yeah, you've, uh, you've, you've got it's so much experience same. and you, you're all about excellence. It's tough with the way the music is changing so fast to kind of be feeling like we're relics of the past and nobody knows what we do. Right. But of course the young ones in the industry, and some of them are the heads of industry now, they don't know. How important, Roger, is it to keep that sense of humility when maybe a receptionist at a company says, okay, who are you and, and what is this about? And I'm thinking to myself, you don't know who Roger Ryan is? Come on. <laughs> sure. Well, my motto mm -hmm. has always been smile and be gracious. I think it diffuses smile so many. Smile and be gracious. Simple as that. Yeah. I mean, I've used that seriously through so much drama. You'd be surprised how many times <laughs> I've, I've used that yeah. and it's diffused things. You know, this business is still built on relationships, whether they're old or new. Yeah. Like I, I did a gig with a, a young man. Um, I can't remember his name now off the top of my head. Hawkins. I think Hawkins something. He's a phenomenal keyboard player. And it was a hit here in town at BB Kings with Chrisette Michelle, a really talented R&B singer. And he, who for the rehearsal, I was like second keyboard player. And this kid, just, he's spaceship as parked somewhere. He's just genius. And I think he actually, <laughs> at the time he was Rihanna's music director, just amazing. Wow. Amazing keyboard mm -hmm. player. And so he was like, so he asked me, he said, so who, you know, who have you played for? And I said, well, you know, I, I played for CC and, <laughs> And he was like, wow, it flipped. And I told him about a couple of other artists, Donnie McClurkin and Whitney and stuff. And he was like, he looked at me like, wow, you know, like, man, it's an honor to know you. I've always, I, I used to listen to their music and I, you were the one on the tour and all that. I said, yeah. And, you know, so it just turned into something different as opposed to, okay, who's this old head guy in, in the room? Because some kids are going to do, do that maybe. And then, but there are other people who understand that where they are has to do with what's happened before. And I don't think that I'm that old that the music I did was so irrelevant. I mean, Winona Judd is still Winona Judd. And I, you know, got to play for her for almost three years. And I did the Lilo and Stitch movie premiere with her, you know, in LA, which, oh, wow. so, you know, you can imagine when I see some people and they're like, okay, Lilo and Stitch, I was such and such age, you know, wow, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you know, but the thing is, it's, it's still a movie premiere and Wonderful World of Disney is Wonderful World of Disney. You know, as a kid, mm -hmm. doing Wonderful World of Disney and thinking that I'd ever play on it is completely bonkers to actually have done it. So I think it's all about relationships and how we view ourselves is how we'll actually respond or how we'll actually engage with those people. Because if you act like, hey, yeah. you, guys, you guys need to come over here so I can give you some knowledge, they'll be like, we don't need you. But you know, yeah, yeah, it, it's all about, I think it's really about us and how we perceive ourselves. I, I don't really think I'm irrelevant. I'm... <laughs> I'm probably fantasizing that I'm still relevant, but the way I stay relevant is I work with other people around me that are younger than I am. I have a couple of incredible yeah. young men that I've mentored that are doing great things like um, Melvin Lightford, who is called Maestro. He lives in LA now. His mom dropped him to my house. They're doctors. And so we saw you playing in church. We don't know anything about music. We'll, we'll, we'll pick him up in a few hours. He goes, hi, I'm Melvin. I said, okay, I'm Roger. <laughs> and now he's doing the, he's scoring the movie Mahalia and he lives in LA. Oh my goodness. So I've been working on my own project and he did some live string arrangements for me. And then there's another guy here. His name is Marcus Perry and he's played for everybody. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, Michael Gaines is one of the um, producers I work with and he's a genius. So, you know, and with his drum programming and his sounds, uh, you know, I'm learning from him, getting inspired and retooled every time he plays me something or works on something with me. My brother, Randy, in New York, actually, he's he's now a nurse practitioner of, for the last three, four years, maybe more. But he has a triple platinum song he co-wrote with Puffy and broke a group called Total. <laughs> and he had a publishing deal. So, you know, I have some relevancy around me, along with, you know, mm -hmm. obviously the things you get to listen to. I think it's up to us to actually stay current and relevant. And, you know, there, yes, there's really I, good I music agree. in the music that's out there. I think sometimes we're so... You know, I'm Earth, Wind & Fire, I'm Chicago, that we can't listen to her, we can't listen to Kendrick Lamar, we can't listen to Snoop, Dr. Dre, Mary J, Brandy. Like, there's so much great music. They're, these people are, they're gods, you know? And, and they didn't start in a music class like you and I, maybe studying with London School of Music. They came off the streets and turned their careers into something bright and beautiful. And 
there's something to be said about that and the way their music sounds and the way it feels. It comes from a place where, yo, this is what happened. This is what happened when we were growing up and our music reflects our our, our past, our roots. And I think yeah. there's something very yeah. authentic, lovely, wonderful, and significant about, about the way these folk create music. Why wouldn't I want to be hip like them? <laughs> You sort of exist in the center of awe. That's where I want to live too. It's not just a day job. It's a, it's a heart job, it's a heart jo which makes me want to ask this next question. Talk to me about your idea, which I agree with that music comes from more than the mind and the heart, but it comes from the soul and how that led into what you named your company after touch music. Well, <laughs> the after touch music is really a short one. My, my brothers came up with that name, especially Randy. I think it was a function on a keyboard. I think even the uh, Uncle oh. Roland D50 in my, you know, now we have the Roland Cloud, so I don't need the, <laughs> plus I'm, I'm preserving this one because I inherited it from the BB and CC tour and it still has the tape on oh. the back because it was a Korg endorsement, but all of their songs were Roland sounds. So anyway, oh. so I have it. <laughs> but, um, That's funny. Yeah, After Touch Music was, the first name that Randy um, gave to me and he and Robert agreed, my brothers. And um, so I kept that and actually turned that name into my, my label and then Roger Ryan Music is presently my production company. But I've always thought that music came from somewhere deeper than just, um, just here, talent. It has to be a soul thing, uh, almost primal because it's, mm -hmm. it's an expression. It's not just technique. There are people, you know, slaves when they were singing they never had a music lesson you know and and billy bob who learned to play his guitar on while he's sitting on the porch at home or the ukulele these people weren't formally trained that somebody gave them a guitar and okay i guess it's been sitting here long enough i better pick it up next thing you know they're playing and they're singing and writing music on it and so you know homeboy's playing his guitar these folk are singing on a farm, on a plantation, and they're singing from somewhere because they don't know where they are. They want to be somewhere else. And the only way that they express themselves is through music. And mm -hmm. can you imagine? Like, I mean, that experience is enough to sing in such a way that not only shakes them, but it probably even shook the masters while they were watching them. They're like, okay, should we let them sing or yeah. not? But boy, this is beautiful. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it, it yeah. probably changed a lot of atmospheres back then. Like music does yeah. when you when you see a guy sitting, you know, rocking on his rocking chair and he's got a little pipe here and he's singing some song about, you know, his history or whatever, or blues or bluegrass, you know, these early signs of uh, uh, music that we listen to and, and we morph it into whatever. There's such a deep connection and such a deep thing coming off of those guys that that wrote it. And I even think that the same thing for classical music, you know, Mozart, oh, yeah. Bach, those guys, and Beethoven. I mean, seriously, their music came from some deep place inside of them. It wasn't just technical. Mozart was doing concerts on his backyard, you know, <laughs> what, when he was, what, six years old or something like that. I mean, that wasn't, yeah. that wasn't just about his lessons. That was because he enjoyed it. He had fun. And, you know, those were the improvisers. So... Yeah. Music does, for me, comes from the soul. And the big thing is, not only does it come from there, but it touches you. And if I can touch you and you experience something from my creation, then I'm really doing my job. I don't want you to tell me or need you to tell me how sophisticated it is. Roger, that yeah. touched me. I can't stop listening to this. Yeah. That is, yeah. to me, a soulful experience. Yeah. When, when I hear a singer, I don't want to hear their vocal technique. I want to just disappear into the song and the message of the song right. and go, oh my gosh. Feel something song. from them. And the technique is only in the service of exactly. you know, delivering, That's delivering a the message in, in a very human way. Um, okay. Well, let's move on to both of us work with new talent now, in addition to the other things that you do. Mm -hmm. In working with new talent, what do you look for? that makes you think they might succeed in music? Gift and personality. Um, th those things are really important because everybody that's gifted is not really cut out for the industry because you have to know uh -huh. how to navigate this industry, how to be able to smile in the wake of craziness backstage, a bad sound check, a jerk for a promoter, you know, anything, anything yeah. that could go wrong. 
And some people aren't cut out for that. So I look for those things. I look for that, the quality in their voice, the fire in their eyes, and that personality that says they're easy to work with. Because, you know, Judy, when yeah. somebody recommends you at our level, if I say, hey, you should call Judy, she's cool. I'm not talking about your ability. I'm talking about the kind of person you are. Because if you weren't mm -hmm. any good, I wouldn't be recommending mm -hmm. you anyway. You know what I mean? Right. And I think right. that's so important for right. us to be thinking in that domain. And sometimes you can groom a person, not just with their gift, but you can groom them to be able to handle everything. So I like the holistic approach. Um, and and mm -hmm. so that's what I look for. I look for the gift and the personality. Okay. So what is your production flow? Like when you take on a new artist for the first time, what do you do first? And how does that flow into the final production? Everything starts with a song, <laughs> you know? I mean, this business is there made of songs. So when I sit with an artist, no matter how talented they are, we're, we're talking about songs. Are you a songwriter? Yeah, right. Okay, let's listen to your songs. If they've got cool songs or songs that I think have a chance at arrangement, production, and their delivery of the vocal, cool. If not, we get songs. After that, um, and I go over the keys. Keys are really important. You know, this new oh, yeah. new thing about writing beats. And then, what is a beat? I thought this was a beat. Anyway, they call tracks beat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so they write to these, they make these beats. But when you write to one of those things, it becomes an organic music life form. And that means mm -hmm. you still have to look back at the artist as opposed to the artist looking to you. So when an artist says, hey, yeah, with cool writing to this, this is what I'm hearing, but it's a little too slow. Can you speed it up? Can you slow it down? Can you raise the key? Can you lower the key? And then there's that clash because these young guys, gals who are so into themselves, know so much, and they're so cool, they don't want to change any of the stuff. So they're not really producers. <laughs> okay. Yeah. My, my production is based on the artist. I started as an accompanist. So I'm still playing for you, even when I'm arranging mm -hmm. and producing. So after I, yeah. we agree on the songs and the keys, I go into arrange mode and I, I pretty much do everything with a click track, even my big band stuff, a metronome and keys. And then I'll do a synth upright yeah. bass and then go cut drums and you know, that kind of thing. So that's pretty much how I, I do it. Then sometimes I'll have them come in and do scratch vocals on the basic arrangements. So now I have mm -hmm. a voice living on the creation. And then I can continue arranging around their voice. Mm -hmm. you, oh, what a so, great idea. Yeah. yeah, I'm always listening in my mm -hmm. head to the voice. Um, after that, I add the, the necessary, the rest of the music. Sometimes I wait for guitars. I think sometimes guitars and strings and stuff. I like to do those things ideally after the vocal is there, depending on the song and the artist, obviously. That way mm -hmm. they also get to play for the singer. Mm -hmm. And after vocals and masters are cut, then I guess mixing and then mastering. Of course, it has to be approved mm -hmm. to make sure that they love it and, and all of that. And then we go to mastering. But that's kind of my, in a nutshell, a really quick nutshell, because that's you know, those incredible. things become circumstantial and time. Yeah. Well, that's an incredible process. And any artist that goes through that with you is very lucky indeed. And no wonder the stuff comes out so well. Uh, time on the vocals, you know, the vocal production is we do, a yeah. big deal. We take time and s sections at a time till they love it, till I love mm -hmm. it. And then I comp the vocals, you know, mm -hmm. as you know, comping and all that. I mean, that's all a part of it. And even comping sometimes drums, which sometimes not necessary because I get to play with the, the greatest guys in town, you know, the Steve Brewsters of the world, Dan Needham's of the world, Marcus Finney, Jeff Pegas. I mean, they make me look good. So, <laughs> but you know, they'll give me different. Well, you are into excellence though. Yeah. I am. Right. Sure. <laughs> different versions and you comp it. Yeah. All right. Well, I, the next thing I want to ask you is going to be hard for you. Okay. So here's the question. Okay. Name one out of all the billions of people you've worked with. Name one of your favorite legendary artists that you've worked with and tell us what makes them so special to you. Okay, that is hard. I know, I didn't figure it'd be hard. <laughs> um, do I have to just pick one? How about two? I'm gonna <laughs> give you, I'll give you two, I'll give you two and a half, I'll give you three short ones, okay? I, I okay, say, you got it. I have it. to that say CC for one because, because they gave me a chance and that opened, that opened doors for my career. They, you know, that, you know, you have to mention. 
um, Mark, you know, Kibble from Take Six, because whatever he saw in me, he nurtured that and made sure that I was there and to be a part of the group, even temporarily, and, and to say that I was one of them is has been a, a big deal internationally. Um, Yolanda Adams, you know, she spent a day with me. I was at a very low point in my life and she came into town and demoed songs with me in my studio. I, I, how can you not, you know, mention mm -hmm. that? Uh, Whitney Houston, for sure. I never got to spend as much time, but when she came to Nashville, I got to play for her and just watching her and talking with her and all that, you know, it was, I listened to Whitney when I was in college and it never dawned on me that I would ever mm -hmm. get to meet her. I, she, she was somebody that, you know, Clive Davis did something very unique and very different with. And so the way she would portray, the way her music was, the story, all of it, I was just, you know, in love with Whitney when I was, and, and uh, the funny thing is my girlfriend did not like it. She just kind of had a thing about, you know, you <laughs> Houston thing. And, and it's so funny. I, I told her, I said to her, I said, Sharon, you know, why would you be angry or argue about Whitney? I said, what are the chances of me even meeting her? She doesn't even know I exist. <laughs> Whoops. And then you go and do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Olita Adams, being in the studio with Olita Adams, she's sweet, she's gentle, she's kind and a big heart, you can tell that. But then her voice mm -hmm. filled up the room when I was doing the Shirley Caesar project, mm -hmm. you know, which is a special project for me because it's my first Grammy nom, you know? And uh, mm -hmm. and then she was engaging afterwards. Did you play the piano on this? I said, yeah. And she took me into the studio, she said, come here. And she sat on the piano with me, no YouTube back then, no selfies, phone technology. And we're sitting there at the piano and she's playing and singing, I'm playing for her. and. It was just crazy, you know, just like, what am I doing in a room <laughs> with Alita Adams, you know, um, and Kim Burrell and, you know, Faith Evans. So these kinds of, you know, these are people that you watch and you go, wow. And then you're sitting in a room and they're singing to your track. It's, um, you know, so there are special things about all of them. Some of those that I mentioned because of where I was in my career in my life, you know, to get to play for Layla, you know, right. Uh, Joey, Joey was getting married and, you know, I, I, I asked him, I said, I want to play for her. So, and I met her and she was so incredibly sweet and kind and such a gift and a voice to, to, to be in the same space with her, you know, and um, experience her and experience playing for her. And she's like, Roger, I'm so nervous. I'm like, you're Layla Hathaway. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, all of those people have special places in my life, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Sheila E. Sheila E. booked me for a tour and had me fly out to, to LA, treated me like gold. You know, I I mean, I can't believe I actually, actually shared the stage with her. So the affirmation is, it's important. We shouldn't live off of it, but boy, it's nice to be affirmed by people that you admire, look up to, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then when we get that, we realize right. how important it is. And the only thing we can really, really do is pay it forward, right? That's, the, only, that's the best way we Absolutely. can we can honor it. There is so much that we haven't talked about because we haven't, haven't had time to I'm talk about that out. you do. But there's one more thing. You're songwriting. You're a songwriter. In fact, you've got your own project, too. You're, you're Roger Ryan, the artist. So tell me about creating your own music okay so i love so many different styles of music you know i yeah me I think too. maybe it's an insecurity thing or whatever it is <laughs> i've been creating music and not putting it out and then over the the last couple of years with this pandemic i would sit and play i'd press record and play whatever i was thinking feeling i would sit and play whatever that topic was and sometimes actually with tears in my eyes through tears really and so I've got this acoustic volume of things. I'm going to probably, I'm um, actually Jeff is mixing my, my engineer and one of my best friends, Jeff Pitzer wouldn't be here without him. And, um, it's going to be called me. It's an acoustic. Cool. Thing. And then I have that I'm fully producing and I'm going to call that me too. <laughs> and some of, some of that stuff is the same thing. You know, one of them is 20 something years old, a piece called rising of the dawn that I wrote, worked on with my cousin, Ronald, 
And then the others are original, you know, my other, there's a song I sat and started playing. This one I did to a click track because I knew it was going to be something that mm -hmm. needed music. It's called When I Can't Find Words. Mm. And Mark Kibble is singing the backgrounds on it. Mm. When he heard it, he cried too. Oh my goodness. It. I'll send you a rough. Oh, I want to hear that. You, but for it is sure. absolutely beautiful. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to re releasing some of this year. And I've had live string sessions on three of them. There's another piece I sat down during the pandemic and I wrote, and this one I definitely mm. came to tears. It's called Healing. Hang and on. It, I mean, it was so random, Judy, that I actually. When 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 Maestro was doing the string arrangement, we had to use a tempo map because it wasn't in strict meter. So Roger, you've got so much out there, and you do so many things. Where can we find you and your music and your services? RogerRyan.net is my website. That, that's with the two R's, and then my Instagram is producer Roger with two R's in the middle. Producer Roger. Love it. And Love that's, it. That's the best way to find me. Right, and we can find out all about After Touch Music, uh, your label there. It's your website, right? So yes, you can you find go. out. Yeah, there'll be a link there. It'll take you to to After Touch Music. Yeah. Well, thank you. It's such an honor to be in your network of the village here. Uh, it of takes course, a good village. <laughs> well, it's been helping my my folks sing and taking them away from their from their their vocal coaches. And like, if you sing with Judy one time. You're not going to want the vocal coach you have now, but we'll see. <laughs> and then they're like, okay, I'm not going back to my vocal coach. Whoops. Well, I, I can't tell you what an honor it is to me because I know that you're into excellence and uh, to, to be a part of your network that you have for artists. So thank you, Roger, for everything that you do. And I love you to pieces. And You so are excellent. You are excellent, Judy. <laughs> That's why. And you're a wonderful person. You're a beautiful human being and a beautiful soul. You are. Well, thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay, my friend. Okay. okay. Take care. Uh, you too.